Hey, welcome back. This is part six of our seven part series on atonement. And if you haven't seen the previous videos, go back and check those out. We have traced this idea of atonement from its earliest days in the old covenant. And we have gone through the general steps showing how when Israel was to bring an offering or a korban, what that entailed and what this all was for. Ultimately, it resulted in atonement. And we left off with the last video showing how the priest would sprinkle the animal's blood not only on the altar, but also in some cases on the holy things, the, the tabernacle furniture. And the Bible says that atonement is not only made for the offerer, but atonement is also made for the holy things. So this begs the question, why does an inanimate object, why do the holy things need atonement? I think we understand why we need atonement, but why those other things? And so we're going to discuss in the final two videos, the two meanings of atonement. Now, in addition to an individual bringing his offering to make atonement for himself, ancient Israel had a special day called the Day of Atonement or Yom Kippur. You can find it in Leviticus chapter 16, and it's still celebrated even today. Yom simply means day and Kippur means atonement. Now, there are other words for atonement depending on whether or not the word is being used as a verb or a noun, etc. But it's all the same word in English, right? It's just atonement. Atonement has two different meanings. And a common mistake today is to try to separate these two meanings out. And what happens is usually one meaning becomes overemphasized and another meaning becomes de-emphasized. But ideally, when we see the word atonement, we should see both of these meanings at work together simultaneously. So what are these meanings? Well, first of all, atonement carries this idea of a ransom payment from death. So, for example, in Exodus chapter 21, verse 28 through 30, you find these strange laws about what happens if another man's ox gores and kills another person. So if nothing like this has ever happened before, then essentially what happens is the ox gets stoned, but the owner goes away free. However, if this ox has shown itself to be dangerous in the past and the owner just lets the ox roam free and doesn't try to do anything to prevent someone else from getting hurt, and in the event that that ox gores and kills another person, then the Bible says that not only the ox, but also the man shall be killed as well. Well, why is that? Well, it's because the owner didn't care enough about others, resulting in the death of another human. Remember what the whole of the law is. Love God and love your neighbor. And so the idea is, because he failed to do that, he should have to pay life for life. However, if the deceased family doesn't want the owner to have to die too, then they can require the owner to pay a ransom of money or a coffer. Thus, the owner can redeem his own life. He's, he's paying essentially for his own life. Think of it as a, a substitute life in the form of a payment. Thus, the owner, instead of having to die, he can redeem his own life by paying this ransom. So, think of it as a, a substitute life in the form of a payment. Now, kofer, while different, comes from the same root as atonement, and it helps us to understand the first meaning of this word. All right, so let's bring that meaning back to Leviticus 1.4 and the context of these animal sacrifices. The Bible says that that animal is your kafar, or it's your atonement. In other words, it's a payment to ransom you from death. Now, when Paul was reflecting on these things, he wrote, the wages of sin is death. 
right? Romans 3.23. In the story of the Bible, death is the result of being exiled outside of Eden into the realm of death. It came about because of Adam and Eve's failure to trust God and to live according to his knowledge and wisdom. So to be human outside of Eden is to be under a death sentence, right? God is giving mankind over to the consequences of his own folly and disastrous choices, letting us die. Death is what we have earned because of our sin. And that's really dismal when you think about it. But it helps us to see the significance of what God was now giving Israel, providing offerings or korban for them. When an Israelite brings the offering that God has provided for him, his life is being redeemed by a substitute in the form of a payment. Okay, so what is God teaching Israel? God is giving Israel the blameless life of a creature to make it available as their substitute. Right? The offering is a kafar, a ransom from death, so that the one bringing the offering can come nearer to God than he ever could on his own. Thus, if my blameless representative, that offering, surrenders its life on my behalf, then God accepts it as kafar or atonement. Understand this. God is giving Israel these offerings to pay him back for the wrong that they have caused him. Now that God is dwelling in Israel's midst, he is inviting Israel to come near to him. But sin and death, the result of our choice to reject him, are like a barrier. These offerings, or korban, are a gift of God's grace to Israel to ransom them from sin and death so that they can come near to him. Now, this was all, of course, pointing to Jesus, the gift of God's Son, who gave himself a ransom for all, to redeem us from death. Listen to how the New Testament puts it. Paul, in Romans 5, 10 and 11, says it this way, For if, when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son, much more, being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. Of course, John 3.16, verse that pretty much everyone knows. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Jesus said it this way in Matthew 20, 28. Even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. Okay, so that's meaning number one, a ransom payment from death. Now we'll look at the second meaning of atonement and offer concluding thoughts as we bring this entire series to an end in part seven. Hope to see you then. Have a good day. Thank you.